Today we're going to talk a little bit about greenhouse uh, sanitation and water uh, water treatment for sanitary sh sanitation purposes. Um, now, the uh, sanitation uh, is defined as uh, when you look at uh, the formulation application of measures to, you know, they're talking about public health, but in the greenhouse we're looking at uh, probably more so to looking at protection of plant health and what does it take to grow good plants and um, that's my um, change to that. The primary things that we need to think about in sanitation, sanitation practices are some of the things that we need to do for prevention, prevention of disease problems, um, keeping the greenhouse clean, inspecting the materials that come in, maintaining a good environment in your greenhouse, or eradicating the problem. So we're looking at several different uh, crops that have specific uh, concerns that, um, for instance, uh, in sanitary practices, these are uh, diseases that we can't avoid in the greenhouse, uh, or we can only avoid them through eradication or through uh, issues. Geraniums, for instance, we uh, have a big issue with a bacterial wilt called xanthomonas. Um, the only way we can control that particular bacterial disease is through good sanitary practices, through using um, pasteurized uh, potting media and stuff like that. And the same thing with Ralstonia. And actually, Ralstonia is um, the, the Ralstonia of the bacterial wilt, Ralstonia that we're really worried about in this particular instance. We'll talk about it more towards the end of the semester we, we're talking about d different diseases, is that one's actually um, considered to be, um, at, puts our whole agriculture in the United States at risk. And it's controlled by APHIS and um, it becomes a quarantine issue. Other color, cro color issues we have, root rots, mildews, white flies, chrysanthemum white rust. Now um, uh, the whole greenhouse industry is very concerned about uh, downy uh, mildew on impatiens because the downy mildew uh, that we're, the, the strains that we're dealing with in impatiens, um, that downy mildew has actually become resistant to many of our fungicides and it's become a major issue. And chrysanthemum white rust is a disease that's of uh, concern because it's, uh, we don't want to get it shipped in from Canada. But so for instance on these uh, poinsettia leaves, that's a little bit of a powdery mildew wilt that we have. So one of the things that we need to do with greenhouse sanitation is we need to work with uh, our, uh, make sure we keep the viruses out, root rots, foliar diseases, insects and mites, of course, um, so forth. Now I know you've all seen the disease triangle, especially if you're in plant disease now. Um, you know that uh, plant, it has three, uh, it's, a th it's a three points of the triangle. Um, for plant disease to happen, you first of all you have to have a susceptible host. In other words, we need to have a plant that's susceptible to that particular disease. And we have to have a causal agent. In other words, we have to have a organism that's going to cause their disease problems or um, and then of course we have to have the favorable environment. And one of the things in greenhouse sanitation that we want to do is to make sure that our environment is clean and or else we don't want to have an environment that's going to lead us to uh, plant disease. So one of the things that we implement in the greenhouse uh, for sanitary practices and greenhouse practices is we use a tech, uh, system that we call integrated pest management. And integrated pest management includes sanitation and that's probably what I'm going to talk about most during this particular lecture is what do we do to keep our greenhouse clean. Sanitation is probably the first part of integrated pest management that most people forget about. If you keep your greenhouse clean, if your staff is not moving plant, uh, contaminated plant material around contaminated soil, uh, you're going to be able to keep a lot of plant diseases out. Another part of um, integrated pest management is eradication. One of the best ways to control a lot of plant diseases and one of the best ways to or even insects is to eradicate the host or if you've got an infected plant or something like this sometimes the easiest treatment 
And the cheapest treatment is to destroy that little group of plants that are infested rather than going in there and nuking it with some pesticide that's going to cost you a lot of money for, with chemistry and labor and time to spray the whole crop. Sometimes the best thing to do is just, okay, I'm going to give up those four or five plants that have an aphid infestation or those four or five plants that have a bad downy mildew infection. Sometimes the best solution is just to get rid of it. And then the other part is exclusion. Or if we can screen our greenhouse, if we can just keep that pest out, uh, oftentimes that's a better tool for uh, managing our greenhouse is through exclusion. So eradication and eradication is where we're going to modify our greenhouse environment in such a way that we're going to discourage that insect and mite infestation. Uh, maybe removing it using disinfectants. Um, we're going to talk about water disinfectants and pasteurization of your potting mix. So for instance, um, this is a, a spray rig in a greenhouse tomato operation. And they use um, traps in addition to the sprayers. And the sprayer goes up and down the greenhouse. And of course, when the sprayer goes up and down the greenhouse, it's, it's more than anything else. It's, it's pushing the insects out because they're dislodged from the sprayer. And they're attracted to those yellow sticky pads. These are about uh, three feet square and we sometimes can eliminate the problems. Another issue that uh, we have is uh, weed control outside the greenhouse. You notice that this operation, they've got a weed barrier on the ground, so we don't have um, plant material growing directly under the vents. And one of the best uh, insect control things that I can find uh, for most greenhouses is a lawnmower. You cannot imagine the number of greenhouses I go to that have bad insect problems looking for something they can spray on the inside of the greenhouse and I walk outside and the weeds are waist high. And they're just sucking in the thrips and sucking in the aphids and white flies in through that. And sometimes just using a bloody lawnmower outside is your best control method. Eradication. Eliminate the pest. There are lots of biological pesticides or a lot of predatory insects. Um, one of the things, if you're using biological control, one of the first things you have to do is change your tolerance. Change your tolerance. One of the biggest uh, problems that we have with the American consumer is if, if they were to buy a flower stem in the market that had aphid carcasses, carcasses from where a predator has come in and killed the adult aphid, and all you have is an aphid carcass, most, most cons American consumers would say would not buy that because they're thinking it's contaminated. Whereas you as an educated population, oh cool, something ate that critter. I mean, that's what you guys would think. But some of, there's some education to the tolerance is what people can, can, can change. Yes, question. So you mentioned how like there can be non-beneficial plants growing outside. Mm -hmm. Is there beneficial plants? Are there beneficial plants that could be growing outside? That's a good question. One of the things that some growers will do is you can put in um, uh, plant banks that, that attract beneficial insects that where you maintain a habitat of, of uh, predatory insects that are going to control that. Y yes, there are some beneficial plants that you could put out there that will attract those predatory insects. And that's a standard organic practice for many farms where they'll maintain uh, banks of plant material to uh, enhance a, a more of a, of a uh, balanced um, biosphere around the farm. And that's used quite often in organic farms, so yes. Uh, I'm not up to date on that. Frank Stoniker would be the one that could uh, help you with that. So, <coughs> um, hey, you notice that pesticides, I'm just now talking about pesticides. I would like you to consider pesticides as a last resort. Uh, but if you're going to use a pesticide, use a pesticide that's species specific. And the reason I'm saying that is. Those new softer chemicals that we're using that have less environmental stress, they are targeting a specific organism. And that way, um, it's, uh, uh, you're going to have a, a better control, and you're not going to kill everything. When, when I was first going to school, first working in the greenhouse industry, 
we used organophosphates and products like that. They killed absolutely everything. My plants were spotless, but I killed everything in the process and probably shortened my own lifespan. But um, anyway, question in the back. Okay, uh, using things like pitcher plants and, and uh, Venus flytraps in a greenhouse, stuff like that, they're not effective at all. Um, those particular types of things, um, if you, they're not targeting most of the pests that we're dealing with. Um, uh, actually, most of the pests that, most of the insects that those particular uh, devices are after are the ones that are predators, um, quite often. Um, but, um, uh, most people that I know that are raising pitcher plants and stuff like this in the greenhouse, they're doing it for a specific market. But um, uh, as far as insect-consuming plants, um, not too much. Um, anybody named Seymour in the room? Feed me, Seymour. Please tell me you've seen that movie. Okay, all right. So if you're going to use a pesticide, use something that's selected for a target species. Make sure that you're getting it in there, making sure you're getting in the, applying it in the right zone, and you're applying it at the right lifestyle, right life cycle stage. One thing that I really like for people to think about is inspecting your plants. What that means as growers is getting out in the greenhouse and looking. The best inspector is the person on the water hose. The greenhouse operation that puts the lowest paid person right off the street with no, strain, with no training on the water hose is the wrong person to have watering your plants. You need to have that skilled person, that trained person, because while they're in there watering plants, they need to be inspecting the plants, doing scouting, looking to see if there's good irrigation practice and stuff like that. Pet plants. I really avoid what I call a pet plant. Now what a pet plant is, is that plant that sh that's been in the greenhouses for 30 years is so full of viruses and diseases and insects that uh, it's contaminating everything, but you're not going to get rid of it because so-and-so's grandmother, great-grandmother gave it to the greenhouse and you can't, you don't have the heart to kill it. Okay, I'm sorry, get rid of it. Um, I get calls all the time from people saying, I have some ferns on my porch, can I ask you to keep them over the winter? And I say, no. They say, well, you have greenhouse space. I said, no, I don't want pet plants in my greenhouse. And I try to get rid of those plants. I try to get rid of them. And get one of the things, if you've got a contaminant in, the, in your greenhouse, you do, it's just nothing but a problem. Screening. Screening your greenhouse with thrip screen. Um, thrip screen is probably one of the most uh, economical ways to control western flower thrips. Uh, positive pressure greenhouses, double doors, uh, such as that. Anything we can do to keep that greenhouse out. If you're buying in plugs, I can't tell you how many boxes of cut cuttings or boxes of plugs that I've opened up that have been shipped to me and I open them up and the white flies come barreling out. I mean, I'm annoyed with that person for shipping them to me in the first place, but I'm not going to put that in my greenhouse right away until I clean it up. Okay, most of the time when we get our plugs in, I mean, you're, you, you're on a time schedule and you've got to plant them right away, but inspect them and ideally quarantine them until you can see that they're insect and disease free. Because a lot of times they're not. So inspect your plants. Um, here's your thrip screen on a greenhouse. Uh, and uh, you can see that it's, it's sort larger surface area than the vents, of course, because we've got to accommodate reduced flow. In the greenhouse, some of the most important things that you can do for insect and disease management and sanitation is keeping your greenhouse clean. Get the leaf litter and the debris off the floor. Uh, I can't tell you how many greenhouses I go into where they're in there pulling or trimming plants and they just throw the leaves on the floor because uh, they figure under the bench it's going to rot anyway. That's going to give you nothing but trouble. And if you're going to put them in garbage cans, those garbage cans need to be dumped every day. You can't leave a full garbage can full of plant litter in the greenhouse because it's going to just do nothing. So you need to make sure those trash cans are taken out. Greenhouses are meant to grow plants, not to store stuff. 
get the storage somewhere else. Because that, what happens is you forget that it's there and uh, you run into problems and that storage is going to harbor opportunities for rodents, opportunities for other insects, uh, slugs and snails and all kinds of stuff. So get the storage out of the greenhouse. Standing water. I know it's a greenhouse. I know you're watering plants, but don't have little puddles of water standing everywhere. Do something about the, the water drainage so you can move the water out. Because when you have standing water, you're going to have algae development. When you have algae development, you get uh, fungus gnats. And we get fungus gnats, then you get fungus gnat larvae into your plants. Next thing you know, you've got a major problem and you uh, need to control, use a pesticide. And of course, those weeds inside and outside. And this picture here, that's exactly what I want my benches to look like underneath. I want them clean. Um, if you're using a surface water for your irrigation supply, make sure your surface water is clean. This particular uh, pond was outside of a greenhouse. Mm -hmm. They were having a problem. And look at all the algae and duckweed growing on that pond. And then that just gets pulled into the, uh, into the greenhouse of the irrigation system and becomes a problem. Question. What about greenhouses that have like aquaponic tanks in them? Greenhouses that have aquaponic tanks. Um, that's a whole nother category. And can you bring that question back to me in a little later in the, in the lecture? OK? Sure. Because we're going to talk about water treatment. But aquaponics is a whole different thing because you not only you need to think about the sanitation for the plants, you also need to think about the sanitation for the fish. So, and the fish are more likely to fall prey to a disease than the plants. I was just wondering about, yeah, the hazard to the plants of having a large body of water in the greenhouse. You know, like if you have a pond in the greenhouse. Well, the thing is that that large body of water for that pond to manage the fish is going to be aerated, and it's not going to be stagnant, and it's not going to be growing algae. Yeah. So that's a different situation than standing water that's becoming stagnant and growing algae and stuff like that. Aquaponics is a whole not, that that's moving water, that's aerified water, it's a lot cleaner and it's being processed. You're already processing it through a bacterial filter and a, a bacterial conversion system to manage the ammonium and the, and the nitrate balance. So that's a totally different picture of sanitation. You're worried about the fish quality, the fish sanitation more than anything else. So, employees in the greenhouse, uh, what are their production practices? You know, one of the things that, one of the biggest problems we have is making sure that employees in the greenhouse are not moving plant uh, plant diseases around. Oftentimes, most people think about washing their hands before they eat. I want the, your employees to wash their hands after they do anything. Um, we have, there's um, a lot of um, viruses in tobacco. T uh, tobacco uh, mosaic virus, there's a couple other viruses too that can be transmitted by the fingers through the tools, through the water, through containers. And we want to make sure that this is a, that a flood floor greenhouse operation, that when, when your employees walk into this situation, we want to make sure their shoes are clean. And quite often what we do is we add, um, foot dips so that people when they go from greenhouse to greenhouse to greenhouse actually walk and step through a sanitary bath to, to clean their shoes. I for one, when I go to greenhouses, probably a, I'm the biggest risk to anybody when I go into a greenhouse. I go in and inspect one greenhouse who is a certified mint grower, certified disease free mint grower. When I go there, first thing I make sure that I do is the first place I've gone on the, the, the day, I make sure that my clothes are freshly laundered. And before I leave there, I make sure I scrub my shoes. You're laughing. That's, that's, that's true. Because if I go to my greenhouses at Perk and then go there, I run a risk of maybe transferring a disease or an insect to that operation. Because I can tell you what, I'm not that focused over here. And, um, but they are because they're, they're certified disease free. And when I go there, I also wear shoe covers. And I put shoe covers on and then when I walk into the greenhouse I walk through a disinfectant trough. This is a, um, a water delivery treatment system. This is an ultraviolet UVC uh, um, water treatment system to sanitize water. 
So keeping your sanitation free, your greenhouse free of diseases is a long ways towards pulling it together. And we use a system for managing your greenhouse sanitary practice and we call it the E3, the E3 system. And the E3 system means you need to evaluate what your um, system is, evaluate what kind of disease pressures you have, what kind of sanitary problems you're going to have. You need to educate your employees, educate yourself, educate your people that are working for you on what kinds of things need to happen. Don't throw the diseased plant materials on the floor. Dump the trash every day. Wash your hands. Um, make sure we make sure that those people know what the different diseases look like. Okay. And then finally, the third part of the E3 is to enforce it. If you've got an employee that's regularly not washing their hands or is regularly trashing stuff on the floor, that person needs to be gone, and um, so forth. And that brings you into compliance. This compliance in this particular instance is not compliance as far as a legal term. It's compliance to the rules that you're enforcing in your business. So evaluation. Look, listen to your employees. A lot of times the employees have been trying to tell their managers or their owners for quite some time that we have a problem. So you need to listen. Get out there and look, assimilate it, and develop a plan. Educate. Go with your employees. Point out the problems. Give them educational materials. Send them to workshops. Um, find online videos. Also provide solutions. And not every solution is in a sprayer. A lot of times that solution is just eradication. Give them, you know, you, if you don't, if you show them what the problems are and you teach them what the problems are, if you don't give them a solution to that problem, it's not going to help you. And encourage them just to do things on their own. And enforcing it is the most important part. Once you give them the rules, you have to enforce the rules. Okay. So that's just a brief overview of general sanitation. I like to spend the rest of the time talking about water sanitation. And water sanitation happens to be one of the areas that I have focused probably the last 10 years of my career on managing water sanitation in the greenhouse. Um, all of these plant pathogens, Pythium, Fusarium, Phytophthora, mosaic viruses, Irwinia, which is a bacterium, all of these things have been found in irrigation water in greenhouses in Colorado. We've, we've done the research. And most growers think of fungicides as the first line of defense. Now one of the things, one of the take home measures I want you to have as when you walk out of this class, when you're thinking about pesticides, I want you to think about a pesticide as a last resort. It's a management tool, it's part of your arsenal, but they're expensive. And most of our fungicides are intended to be applied to the, you know, for root zone. Um, you can apply them through the irrigation system, but blending it and pushing a fungicide through the irrigation system with every irrigation is bad. Why would that be? Can you think of any reasons why pushing fungicides through the irrigation system could be bad? Or incorporating it in your irrigation? Some people say, why don't I inject a fungicide every time I water, and that way I don't have to ever worry about a disease. Does it accumulate? OK. Actually, what happens over time, especially if it's an ebb and flood operation, or recycling the water, it can become dilute. And if the fungicide goes dilute, what happens to it? Some of the fungi and bacteria, whatever, start to survive because they may be genetically resistant. And if we allow those genetically resistant fungi to survive in a dilute fungicide, all of a sudden we start to develop a stronger disease. It becomes resistant to it. Also, it has a tendency to probably accumulate over time and become toxic. 
Also something you need to remember, whenever you use a piece of equipment to apply a pesticide, that piece of equipment now is a pesticide application equipment. And I don't care if it's an organic pesticide or a conventional pesticide. It's now a piece of pesticide application equipment and needs to be handled as such by an apply a pesticide applicator. So I like to keep my pesticide application equipment separate from my irrigation equipment for that very reason. Because now it has to be handled. So if you've got an uh, irrigation system, it's now becoming an application system. And like I said, EPA does not consider a pesticide any different whether it's a conventional or an organic. It's still a pesticide. So irrigation water and fungicides don't mix. However, for disease, for irrigation water disinfection, these are the systems that work the best for us in the greenhouse. UVC sterilization, heat treatment, chlorine, ozone, or hydrogen peroxide. And these are the systems that we are having the best luck with. So let's start with ultraviolet radiation. Most of the consumers out there think ultraviolet radiation is what pl makes plant grow. No. Visible light makes plant grow. Okay. Ultraviolet radiation is that electromagnetic radi radiation between 200 and 400 nanometers. Okay, this is not visible light. It's a shorter wavelength. Okay, and <coughs> ultraviolet radiation um, is very different from visible light. So they put UV radiation into three categories, and that's that's a spectrum of UV exposure on the on the on the Earth. So UV radiation is split into three categories. We have UVA radiation which is 315 to 400 nanometers. Some of you know that as a black light, okay? This is what deteriorates smog, fades fabric, uh, fades paint. Um, when, when it's exposed to nitrous oxide, so like it's what creates smog, like smog and stuff like that. UVB radiation is 290 to 315 nanometers and this is the radiation that causes uh, sunburn or suntan. Uh, this is the, with the UV radiation that impacts plant material. Question in the back. Is UVA the one that causes cancer? UVA that causes cancer? Uh, UVA and UVB, yes. Both, Both of them do. Okay. More UVB than A. Mostly B. Okay. B is the one that, that can, can hurt you give you sunburns and stuff like that. UVC is the shortest and the most biologically active. It's 220 to 290 nanometers. And most of it is absorbed by the ozone layer. Actually, all of it is absorbed by the ozone layer. If UVC radiation was to hit, strike us on the face of the Earth, we would die. It disrupts, it's a DNA disruptor. UVC radiation is lethal and it's absorbed by the ozone layer. That's why we're worried about things like methyl bromide and chlorofluorocarbons and stuff like that that deplete the ozone layer because the ozone layer is what protects us from UVC radiation. Okay? So, we use UVC radiation. We generate it in a lamp and we use it as a sterilizer. For instance, if we put a UVC dose of 80 80 millijoules per square centimeter. 80 millijoules per square centimeter. That that is enough energy to kill back most bacteria, most nematodes, Pythium, Phytophthora, Fusarium, all those diseases. Okay, and this is even in somewhat turbid water. In other words, it's got about 25 percent clarity because when it comes back through the recycling in the greenhouse, it's going to have some debris in it, and the UVC radiation will clean it. Now, if we've got things like Pepino mosaic virus, which is a pretty bad tomato virus, uh, it takes twice as much. And then all the rest of the viruses, it takes 250. So that's a pretty lethal dose and of, of UVC radiation. UVC radiation, um, this picture on the right is a, is a Violux system. Uh, this is commercially sold by the Priva company uh, for de specifically designed for greenhouse applications. Um, this picture on the left is a 
a lamp chamber. Um, these are used, UVC radiation uh, devices are used in water treatment, both for swimming pools. Uh, the, la the latest UVC radiation uh, treatment system I've seen installed in Larimer County is up at the um, Abbey at Walburga, and they've installed it on their um, wastewater system to sanitize the water coming out of, before it goes through their, uh, into, out of their septic tank into their drain field. Um, it's a beautiful system. But we have a, a lamp on the inside. You can see the cutaway. Uh, these are always shielded because UVC radiation will hurt you. Um, and the lamp is on the inside. Here's a double bank system. Again, this is the Priva system where it's designed to treat. One of the things that I've seen in the data that I've seen on these UVC treatment systems is they usually pay for themselves in six <coughs> or eight months because we're able to recycle our water and reduce our fungicide. Um, and since we're recycling our water, we're also saving on fertilizer. So these UV UVC radiation systems are very beneficial in our greenhouse. I'm sorry? UVC won't destroy the fertilizer? UVC radiation does not destroy the fertilizer. UVC radiation only disrupts the DNA. UVC radiation does not, de does not um, do anything to, the, uh, to the, the mineral chemistry of a fertilizer solution. So, so here's, here's the UVC light chamber. And the water it moves through this. And there's a lamp in the inside that's got a squeegee that's constantly uh, cleaning off the system and here's a picture of the water a drawing of a UVC radiation chamber and here you can see a drawing of how it the squeegee works to clean off the lamp so these systems are very effective the issues are um, with UVC radiation of course it's is we're putting light through the system so if it's got any debris anything to De de reduces the clarity of uh, the water. It's going to, uh, we're going to have to have a longer contact time or higher, uh, higher intensity UVC radiation. Um, water scale, in other words, uh, build up on the lamp itself is going to give us a problem. And the other thing that UVC radiation doesn't provide us is what we call a residual disinfectant property. In other words, when the water leaves that lamp, it's disinfected. After it leaves the plant, after it leaves the lamp, it's no longer disinfected because now it's, res it's if there's an opportunity for c contamination, it can be easily recontaminated. But on the other hand, the lack of residual dis chemistry in there is also a benefit. So we're not adding any chemistry in the system to make this work. In Europe, a lot of growers use heat pasteurization. They heat their water to 203 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 seconds, kills most of our organisms. Um, heat pasteurization, uh, like I said, works very well. Um, this is a pasteurization system. I didn't get a very good picture of it. It's attached to a, a steam boiler, and the water is heated as it goes through the boiler and comes out through the system um, to heat the water. The issue with heat pasteurization is it takes 270 to 530 cubic feet of natural gas per 100 gallons of water, or three to five therms, so you're spending a lot of money. And so a lot of people in the United States do not use heat pasteurization because of fuel costs. But it does work. Oops. The next part of water disinfection. How do they cool that water down? How do they cool the water down? Um, usually, by the time it gets to the greenhouse, it's cool. Are they using that? Are they using? They're using it. A lot of the greenhouses are using it. With, they want their water warm anyway. Some are people like warm water that? irrigation. So. Are they using that lost energy to heat the greenhouse? Or are, they are they using the lost energy to heat the greenhouse? No. So they're just burning they just gas and money. Burning, burning gas and money. Yeah. Could you use electric uh, nickel coils? Sure, you can use electricity to heat the water, yes. Would that be cheaper than using natural gas? Or? 
guess it Natural gas is typically cheaper per unit than uh, electricity. Okay. Typically. It depends on what culture you're working in, you know, what the subsidies or what the prices that are using photovoltaic. There are a lot, there's lots of pictures in there that you'd have to look at to see the price per kilowatt and per decatherm, what the costs are. You'd have to weigh the, all of those things. And I usually find that heating your water for pasteurization in this country is rarely effective. Yes? So there's no way to harness that? Bottom. Well, that lost energy, it's still in the greenhouse, and it's still going into your, you know, there's, there's energy going into the greenhouse. But you're typically attaching this to a boiler, and you might be using waste heat anyway on that boiler. So it's a practice I'm not fond of. That's my personal opinion. So, Oxidation reduction chemistry is another type of water sanitation system. And this is uh, an oxidation where, we're, where oxidation is increase in positive oxidation with corresponding loss of electrons. And reduction is a decrease. And what we're using is an oxidation reduction chemical to oxidize um, our waste our oxidize our disease organisms. Now, the oxidation chemicals, chemistries that are most common, uh, bromine is the lowest one. Bromine is uh, an oxidation reduction chemistry that's used most frequently like in a hot tub or a water spa or a swimming pool or something like that. Uh, I use bromine in our greenhouses to treat pad water, to keep the pad water free of algae. It's, very, it's pretty low oxidation. Uh, chlorine, chlorine in this form is, uh, this is the baseline for most, this is actually hypochlorite or hypochlorate, okay? And uh, this form of chlorine, if we were to inject chlorine gas into our water, it'll form a chlorate molecule. If we were to use chlorine bleach, um, that you, uh, that's sodium hypochlorite, if you used to use, um, Calcium hypochlorite, which is a lot of a lot of swimming pools use that. That's very common. Chlorine dioxide is a gas, a little more oxidizer. Potassium permanganate is used by some water treatment companies for occasional flushes. If you're ever working in a rural community, something like salts in the water is kind of a light tinged purple. They did a flush with high, um, potassium permanganate. Hydrogen peroxide um, is a very effective. Uh, chemical, ozone, and then fluorine. We don't use fluorine in the green in green in greenhouse industry because it's way too toxic. How often do you have to re <coughs> excuse me? How often do you have to re up your hydrogen peroxide? How quick does it dissipate? Instantly, it dissipates instantly. All of these chemicals have to be constantly injected if you want a residual chemistry. So I take H two O two. Mixture, it in the tank, and it's, it's gone. Well, if it's if it's, it's taken out any mac microorganisms that are there, but uh, hydrogen, you know, once it oxidizes and does its job, it's gone. That's the beauty behind hydrogen peroxide. Once it does its job, it's gone. You do it once a day, then, or, or? just hang on. We'll come back. So. Most people, this is NaOCl, this is uh, bleach, okay? Bleach that we buy in the grocery store is what, 3%? The, the sodium hydroxide, sodium hypochlorite that we're using in greenhouses typically could be as high as 35%, industrial bleach, yes. Can you just buy the salts? Can you just buy the salts? Um, NaOCl, uh, that's, you've got to uh, electrify it to get it there, okay? So it's also, we like to think of the terms of what's called oxidation reduction potential, okay? In other words, we're measuring the voltage that that chemistry has. We stick a little platinum electrode into the water and it measures the number of millivolts that it's got. And you can see that 3% NaOCl, which is, which is straight bleach, has got an oxidation potential of about 570 millivolts, but it's got a pH of 11.7. The pH goes down, our, it goes, it, um, changes. And what we're trying to do is maintain our chemistry in our water with 
hyp with chlorate and not chlorite because chlorite is not, um, it's already been oxidized. Chlorate is got the, the ORP, the oxidation reduction potential, and it changes with solution pH. In other words, we want to keep everything active. And that's as much chemistry as I'm going to give you today. Yes? Can you change the pH in the soil by the water you fertilize it with? Not really. Or steam, too, like what we were talking about on the No, you're not going to change the pH with the water or the steam. Okay. We're going to talk about that after spring break. Okay. So this is a project where we did, we, did, we took hypochlorous acid, we injected it into the water, and these are the ORP levels. And you can see every point we injected it. And when we acid injected it and raised, dropped the pH down, we increased our activity. And what we're seeing in the greenhouse industry is that we're looking for an ORP of about 825 millivolts, which is a free chlorine reading of about 1.4 or 2.25 parts per million. Um, that's about 30% more than what's injected into municipal water because we're trying to kill Pythium, which is a fungi, whereas municipal water people are trying to kill these guys. Like E. coli 0157H7, this is the E. coli that we want to stay out away from that gets in our hamburger meat, okay? And it takes, you know, at an ORP of 665 millivolts, which is about one part per million, it takes 10 seconds to kill that organism. Remember, before we started chlorinating our water in the United States, at the turn of the, from the 1900s to the, to the 20th century, 250,000 people a year died from typhoid alone. Okay? So that's what chlorine has done for our culture. Salmonella, it's a little harder to kill. Listeria, a little harder to kill. And thermotolerant fecal coliforms are the hardest to kill. But we're looking at 660 millivolts Whereas in the green in the greenhouse industry, we're needing about 825 to kill Pythium. And um, there's some reading material on there. What do we do? How do we manage it? Um, most people that are injecting some kind of an oxidation reduction chemical, we want them to use an inline ORP uh, meter. Um, or you can use a handheld meter like I showed you in class the other day. Um, these, of course, that's more expensive. This is less expensive. And then, or you could just get a free chlorine kit from your spa store. I, I mean, I buy, I have a hot tub in my backyard, and um, to measure my my uh, chemistry in my hot tub, it's my youngest son's job to to manage that, and he's actually got a pretty good handle on keeping it very balanced. Um, when I do it, the last time I touch the chlorination system on our hot tub, uh, I turned a, pa a pair of swimming trunks from dark blue to gray. <laughs> <laughs> so chlorine sources, the cheapest chlorine source is chlorine gas. And we take chlorine gas and we inject it into water. It forms hydrochloric acid and chlorate. Sodium hypochlorite, this is bleach. When we inject, blend it with water, NaOCl, that's salt. We blend that with water. We form sodium hydroxide and chlorate. Calcium hypochlorite, we inject that into water. We uh, calcium chlorate plus water. We get calcium hydroxide and uh, chlorate. Chlorine dioxide has to be generated. We have to generate it with a chlorate plus hydrochloric acid plus sodium chlorate. We generate chlorine dioxide and sodium chlorate. Which of these products do you want to use? You want to use chlorine gas? It's the cheapest. It's the cheapest. We're going to inject it at 25 to 200 parts per million, keep the pH around 6 to 6, 7.5. However, it's extremely dangerous to handle. You actually have to have trained staff that have licensed 
you have to have uh, alarm systems, you have to have cages to enclose things. You've all been to swimming pools where they have this caged system. Hardly anybody uses chlorine gas anymore. It's just too dangerous. Sodium hypochlorite or bleach, these are drums. This is in a greenhouse. This is 35% uh, sodium hypochlorite. And you can see the sodium hydroxide debris residue on the outside. But it's very cheap to set up. They just use a chemical dosing pump, which costs about $900. And it's injected into the water line right here at a metered source. Question. So you said the chlorine gas is the cheapest? Chlorine gas is the cheapest. Is that the cheapest just to get the gas, or does that include all the different costs for you know, licensing? It's the cheapest for the gas. You're exactly right. You're exactly on target. When you start thinking about it, the trained staff and the equipment, and all of a sudden it becomes very costly because of the, of the relative toxicity of the system. You're exactly right. A 55 gallon drum of sodium hypochlorite is pretty cheap. Bleach is not expensive. And there are bleaches you can buy that are registered by EPA for use in nursery and greenhouse for water treatment. This is a um, hypochlorous acid system. This is one of the systems I have experience with. This is a product that's manufactured in uh, Nevada. It was originally designed for treatment of um, water cooling, to chilling towers for air conditioners. And if any of you know anything about water chilling towers for air conditioners in Las Vegas, they were found to have a contaminant that we now know as, you know, um, the name just went out of my brain. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, mine too. Huh? But anyway, it was so for cleaning up Make it keeping the, the towers clean. What they've done is they've done a chemical process where they have removed the sodium hydroxide from the system. So they only have a hydrogen ion and the chlorate ion. So it's very clean. And as you can see, the system is spotless. And it works very well. We have the metering pump that doses and um, an ORP sensor that measures the ORP as it goes through the system. Calcium hypochlorite. Um, this is a, a, they use a tablet, and the calcium hypochlorite comes in a, it's about the, the tablets are about the size of a hockey puck. And we put this into a reservoir like this, and we, it runs water through it, and makes a chlorate concentrate. The byproduct is calcium, so it's not sodium. So calcium is a essential element, so it's a cleaner system for the greenhouses. And this is actually at Welby Gardens. This is their system that they use for uh, injecting uh, chlorine into their water system. Uh, another uh, type of calcium hypochlorite system, this is one of the more elegant solutions, is they have a magazine where we stack the, ca um, we stack the tablets in a magazine, and as they dissolve into the water over time, they just drop it down in place, and it feeds itself and inject it into a water storage system where it's blended and works as a constant feed system. And all of these systems are metered by a ORP meter so we can determine how much chlorine needs to be put into the system at a time. And one of the problems with hypochlorous acid, which comes from chlorine gas, uh, chlorine bleach, and calcium hypochlorite, is that when it reacts with organic molecules, it also forms in low concentrations a, a byproduct called trihalomethanes. And trihalomethanes, as far as you're concerned, are potentially carcinogenic over your lifespan. Okay? Uh, in greenhouses, we have um, anecdotal information that says that they could be toxic to plants like geraniums and such as that. And the only time we've ever seen this is in systems that have used hypochlorite systems for 20 years plus in a recirculating greenhouse. Builds up in the pond. Like I said, it's anecdotal. We don't have any data to prove it. But one of the things, because of this, a lot of greenhouses and most municipal water treatment systems, because of the trihalomethanes, are switching to chlorine dioxide. Chlorine dioxide is a diff is a, has more ORP per unit than does the chlorate molecule. And it's a cleaner system. And we push sodium chloride 
from a storage system through an electrified cell, we gener generate the chlorine dioxide gas. So it's 25 times more uh, effective without the trihalomethanes. So it's a cleaner system, and most municipal water that's chlorine treated uses the uh, chlorine dioxide generator now. Now, for most greenhouses, chlorine dioxide generators are too expensive, unless you're 30, 40 acres in size. However, uh, there are now technologies, and um, we can buy concentrated chlorine dioxide in a liquid bottle, in a concentrated form, for that has a relatively good shelf life, and currently. My research group is working on with chlorine dioxide um, liquid formulations today, and that's one of the, the focus of some of my research. So the chlorine dioxide is a very good chemical to work with. Yes. Do these systems sit, fail very often and annihilate a crop? No, not really. There's um, actually you can put you can expose a plant to pretty high chlorine levels, a lot higher than most people will tell you, um, without any problems. Um, you're not uh, applying that much, and if they fail, they're usually going to fail to the point of not generating, put injecting, then putting too much in. That's typically the case. They typically fail on the on the, the negative side of not generating, putting a product in. Yes? Are those little hockey puck things the same thing as urinal cakes? Are those little hockey puck things the same thing as a urinal cake? No, <laughs> they're not. <laughs> Ladies probably don't know what those are. Um, <laughs> those are actually more of a product to start pre um, disintegrating, pre-treating the uric, uric acid and also as an odorizer. Now they may have a disinfectant in them. The disinfectant could be um, calcium hypochlorite or a bleach or something like that. But those are, most, those are more for odor control than anything else. So, yes? Um, I would probably say a hundred, uh, I, I really don't know, I know that you can put too much bleach on a plant and kill the, you know, but typically um, in tissue culture we use 10% bleach which is uh, what 0.03% um, sodium hypochlorite and that's not going to hurt your plant too much. Um, I think if you go over much more than that, you're going to have problems. Yes? The use of chlorine in such a hard amount, wouldn't that also increase your salts buildup eventually? Using a chlorine of that, that much, it will increase your salt buildup. Uh, in the situation with sodium hypochlorite, or you're going to have a high buildup of sodium hydroxide, we're actually looking at trying to put approximately one to two parts per million free chlorine in our system. And that's really fairly low as far as building up of salts. Uh, you're going to have more of an impact from salts from your uh, fertilizer salts than you will from the chlorine. Now where we do run into problems with uh, chlorine salts is if you're going to use a reverse osmosis system after your chlorination because chlorine damages the membranes in a reverse osmosis water treatment system. So a lot of growers that use reverse osmosis is after the water is being chlorinated to take it in from the supply system, they'll run it through an activated charcoal filter to strip the chlorine out, that to protect the RO system. This particular operation that I know that does this, they're treating their irrigation water with um, sodium hypochlorite as it comes into the greenhouse because their next door neighbor has a poorly functioning a drain field system and their water is treating is got a, about 1500 um, units of colony forming units fecal, col fecal coliforms. Now they're treating the water not 
for the plants, they're treating the water for their employees. Because even though they're not supposed to go in there and drink the water, the likelihood of somebody getting their hands wet and touching their mouth is pretty high. So they're treating the water to protect the chlorine. Then they have to go in and take the chlorine out with an activated charcoal system to protect the reverse osmosis system. So it gets complicated. And that's why we hire water engineers to design our systems. So, yes. Okay. The next one I want to talk about is ozone. Now, ozone is natural. It's up, up in the atmosphere where it needs to be, but ozone is also generated by your car. Okay. Ozone is uh, generated by copy mach photocopy machines, and actually, that's it's that electrif electrification of the laser printer, that that, that ozone generation. It's what makes your your photocopy machines work, which makes everything work. And it's that sweet smell we smell from the arc welder, that sweet smell from the copy machine or the laser printer that's been running too long, or the sweet smell, if you've ever experienced it, from a lightning strike. And when I smell that sweet smell after a lightning strike, I know that, oh my gosh, I'm in the wrong spot. Okay. So what ozone is, is normal oxygen gas is two um, atoms of oxygen joined together, okay, we have O2, but when we expose it to the electric charge, we put a double bond in there, like what the chlorine dioxide does, but it's got two double bonds, and it creates that ozone, and this is our oxidation reduction molecule. And it's unstable, you know, it's, it's, it's unstable, it's not a happy camper and stuff like that. And when it touches something that it oxidizes, it breaks, breaks apart, oxidizes it goes through an ORP, oxidation reduction uh, pr process, and becomes oxygen gas. Okay? So it's very easy to create, and it oxidizes organic materials at levels greater than chlorine does. And it's a very effective water sanitation system. So this is a, water, this is a chlorine uh, ozone generator in a greenhouse where they've got these um, electro... electro Electrodes where the water, no, the electrodes where ga atmospheric gas is passed through it, where we push the air through it, we electrify it, and this uses what's called um, corona discharge practice. And the cor you know, corona discharge is like basically these are lightning strikes in a glass tube. Looks like a Frankenstein movie. Bzz, 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 that's what it sounds like. Um, and pumps through the system. And then it's injected in with a turbulator in the bottom of a tank. And the water th from the greenhouse is treated with the ozone. So this works pretty well. Um, can you see some benefits of the ozone system over chlorine? It's air. It's air. So it makes it what? Organic. Because there's no chemistry. It's just oxygen. How much do they cost to run? They're not cheap, but they're cheaper than fungicides. So is it air that's being... There, we're injecting ozone gas into that tank, and it's got, a, it's got a Venturi system at the bottom of the tank where it, water is being pulled across it and air is being injected into it. Think of it as a giant aquarium air pump okay. that's got ozone gas, okay? All right. In fact, ozone generation systems are quite common. You can buy an ozone generation system for your home if you live in a rural area and you want to treat your own water. You can buy UVC water sterilization systems that can fit under your kitchen sink. I know when I've traveled into South America and go visit friends that live out in rural areas that don't have water treatment, they have water treatment um, because the water isn't clean. I mean, we are so spoiled in this country with clean water. We are so spoiled. I can remember a day growing up in, in South Louisiana and when I was in grade school, we still had open sewers. And that was in the 1960s. We are so blessed with clean water. In Fort Collins, we are even doubly blessed with clean water. So. So back to these compounds. We've got bromine, Chlorine, chlorine dioxide, um, and ozone are 
probably some of the most common products you'll see used in the greenhouse today. Hydrogen peroxide is another chemical that's coming online uh, with uh, availabilities. Um, you can buy hydrogen peroxide. You can go down to Walgreens and buy it as a disinfectant and put it in your ears. You can use it to clean your wounds. That little bubbling that you see as it's going, that's the oxidation reduction uh, practice that's process is happening for like a, uh, like a surface disinfectant for a wound. 10% is what they use to bleach your hair. I don't see any bleached hair in the room. I see some that scares me. <laughs> You've been waiting for that, haven't you? 35% <laughs> is industrial grade. So a 35% drum of hydrogen peroxide here this particular drum of hydrogen peroxide does not have a greenhouse label on it. It's labeled for treatment of water sewage. This particular greenhouse got a good buy on it. Violation of safe handling practices. In fact, 35% and higher, or 100% hydrogen peroxide, what is that used for? Anybody know? It's very explosive and it's used in space transport. That's the oxygen source for rocket fuel. <laughs> That's what blew up the space shuttle. If you take 35% hydrogen peroxide or higher and you drizzle it onto a piece of dried wood, it catches on fire. Awesome. You say 35%? 35% and higher, yeah. Now you're thinking, okay, I'm buying Oxidate, aren't you? There is a product called there's a product called uh, Zerotol and Oxidate that's about 35 percent. Now what this what this company is 27 percent. What this company has done is uh, this is BioSafe Systems, and there's a couple other companies now. They're selling a hydrogen peroxide labeled product, okay? Whereas that 55 gallon drum that you bought from Van Waters and Rogers is not legal to use this product you can use in a greenhouse because they have gone through the efforts of labeling it for greenhouse use. Okay? Does it cost more money? Absolutely, but you're paying for the label. In other words, you're legal. And they went through the labeling process. It's called GRAS, G-R-A-S, generally regarded as safe. Okay? <laughs> it is safe. Okay? <laughs> Generally regarded as safe. That's the la that's an, that's an actually EPA term. Um, <laughs> when you inject hydrogen peroxide into your system, and I don't care if they hydro call it hydrogen peroxide or hydrogen dioxide, it's the same thing. When you inject it into the system and it reacts with an organic molecule or microorganisms, and it oxidizes, what's left? Water and oxygen. They have an for organic formulation called Oxidate. I think that's what it's called. So you're organic. However, I want you to remember something. Ozone, UVC, hydrogen peroxide is not quite there. Right? What you have when you inject those into your systems, you, or UV, UVC, there's no residual chemistry, which is good. Or is it? When you use chlorine, there's residual chemistry. Which is bad, or is it? The residual chemistry means one of the goals when they inject chlorine water into municipal water systems is they want the chlorine to be dissipated into a f uh, no longer free chlorine state. So when it gets to your tap that you're going to drink it, the chlorine is no longer effective. That's their goal by the time it gets to your house but it's sanitizing all the way down the line. So if there's a water contamination somewhere in the line, you're going to get safe water. In the greenhouse, you're going to have the residual disinfectant always taking care of maybe a microorganism or two. These products, UVC, hot water, uh, hydrogen peroxide, ozone, once it's reacted, it's gone. There is no residual chemistry. So there are pros and cons. <laughs> 